Welcome to Before They Change the World, where we explore the minds, ideas, and dreams of exceptional students working on inspiring projects before they change the world. This episode is hosted by me, David, and I speak with Max, who at the time of recording was a few days away from graduating from his Master's of Robotics at ETH Zurich and starting a full-time job uh, at Zipline in San Francisco. He's a good friend of mine as we both studied aerospace engineering for our bachelors at TU Delft and then transitioned to robotics at ETH. This episode was recorded at the end of our year as roommates, and we have one last interesting conversation about everything from his experience in elite sport to his recent white paper about global incentive structures as well as zipline. I hope you enjoy. Just looking at your website, there's projects in many different fields and it really looks very impressive that you've done all of this next to your studies. Is all of this independent or is a majority of it also based on courses that you've taken at university? Most of it is sort of individual projects that I had in mind and I wanted to prove to myself that I could do that. So I had an idea in mind and I, I was like, oh, it would be really cool if I put this into practice. Yeah. So um, especially the, the, the things that you see that are related to aerospace, those are things that I learned at uni. And then I came back to, to home and I said, I really want to have a program that solves this equation or that does this orbital propagation mm -hmm. from orbital mechanics thing. Right. Or you see there are the robot that solves the Rubik's Cube. At some point I was passionate about the Rubik's Cube mm -hmm. and I wanted to program a robot that could solve it. And a lot of optimization problems, just because I'm passionate about optimization, and um, one, one thing I can notice here as well is that you really enjoy visualizing things. So all of these projects have some kind of visual that complements them, uh, which really makes it a very nice looking website. But I guess it also has many other benefits for you. Um, yeah, definitely. For, for me, the visualization aspect is very, very important, uh, not only for the final outcome, but for the development process, because um, well, first of all, I make a lot of mistakes, you know, and visualizing something is the one of the best forms of validation, you know, to see that your the thing that you're intending to program actually works. Yeah. Um, and I, I've always put a lot of effort in the visualization aspects because in the long run, it pays dividends. In the long run, it makes you understand everything much better. And it's also very appealing, you know, to see a robot in 3D that it's moving its arms or or the, the, you know, the, the picture of planets orbiting uh, right. the, the solar system or yeah. this, this kind of thing. Yeah. How did you go from you know, writing your first lines of code to all the projects that I see on your portfolio website? How was that evolution? It was, um, I would say, almost 100% self-taught. Um, I, I, I consider myself so lucky to have been born in the YouTube revolution per se. Not, now it's not only YouTube, but online learning revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and at first it was uh, maybe the first few steps my father was involved. But after that, I discovered, you know, how to learn for myself. Mm -hmm. and, and it was mostly on YouTube videos. Uh, first, it was on how to create, you know, small HTML uh, websites and then I got into a bit of game development mm -hmm. and, um, and all through YouTube. And after that, when I started uni, I transitioned to more sort of mm, official courses, like not individual YouTube videos, but more like MIT open source core, uh, open course, open, oh, open, <laughs> open courseware, open, open course courseware, right? Yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah, I, I forgot the name, but I don't know why, because it, it's like my uni, you know, it's, I've, I've learned so much more in open courseware than anywhere else, including my university well, in Delft. I've heard some stories from mutual friends <laughs> that uh, apparently when you were young, when you were in high school in your little village in Spain, you were seen as a rising star, <laughs> but it wasn't uh, for, for programming, it was more for swimming. This is completely different. <laughs> so can you explain? Yeah, what? it wasn't actually swimming. It was fin swimming, oh. which is a minority sport. It's swimming, but with fins. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in my, in my town, we had a club for fin swimming and I, w I was very passionate about it. During a few years, I took it to, you know, the, the next level where I was training six days a week, two times a day. And, you know, I almost had like a personal coach. Uh, well, we shared it with, with uh, my other, like the other teammate that was very competitive. Mm -hmm. 
and I yeah I was really driven by by by, by it you know it it at some point I my dream was to become a professional fin swimmer so okay so that's what you saw yourself doing full time not not full time but it was always like something that I would be would have been very proud to, to do okay. um, until at some point I was too passionate about programming that it sounds sort of balanced it okay but yeah. Okay, so wait, when when did that balance tip towards the programming side? In, in the last years of high school when I really got into okay. more involved programming projects okay. and I, you know, I wanted to exploit more like my analytical skills. Okay, uh, yeah. and then you started thinking about university, I guess, a bit and maybe seeing your life in that direction too. Exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay cool. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, but first of all, I want to ask, um, what was fueling you? Because, you know, you were probably training many days a week, very difficult trainings, mm -hmm. like there's probably yeah. a lot of pe physical pain <laughs> yeah, involved yeah. to get to this level. Uh, you must have a fire inside yeah. you and I, I really wonder where that comes from. Yeah. yeah, to be quite frank, I didn't really enjoy the, the, the training <laughs> aspect of it, you know, like to be uh, almost about to vomit or this is not appealing, but there's so many fulfilling aspects of it. Uh, especially you know being part of a team and, and traveling with a national team and you know going to see other countries in the world for me it was my way of visiting different countries you know mm -hmm. it was my the way i would do tourism and also to to prove myself that i could you know yeah. uh, improve o over time and also i was very lucky that i had a teammate that was also very competitive mm -hmm. so we constantly pushed each other and that was you know, I, I wanted to beat him and he wanted to beat me, of course, in a very healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that also fueled me, you know, knowing that I wanted to be better than myself and also better than him. Okay. So um, by better, in this case, Faster. you're talking about <laughs> a specific distance that you both did? We, we actually had divergent paths. So he, okay. within fin swimming, you had uh, swimming with one fin, which is like the oh. normal mode, actually. Right. And then you have swimming with two fins. Yeah. And was, I was more one fin and he okay. was two fins. Uh, but still, I wanted to be better at my thing that he was at his thing. And the opposite is also true. Again, in a very healthy way. I'm super yeah. proud that we managed to keep this very healthy. We were best friends, so these are the best friends. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Okay, and um, so I, I mean, I can relate to to doing some sports and getting obsessed by them. And uh, to me, the, the the fact that it's measurable makes it um, makes it addicting in a way, like almost yeah, like a yeah. video game, right? So I, true, I yeah. in my first year of of uh, of um, university I, I went into competitive rowing and there every stroke literally you're looking at a screen the whole time you're looking at how much power you're pulling yeah. every single second uh, so I guess for you it was maybe also important to, to get that quick feedback yeah um, it's very nice to look at that way now that I think it it really looked like a video game you know I want to be, yeah. uh, you know in, in keep improving yeah. Uh, so yeah I also took it very technical I had like an excel sheet with all my progression of the times for uh, for all of my distances and I remember I would set sort of goals uh, that I wanted to achieve and I tried to extrapolate you know considering my current progress how is my how, where am I gonna reach in like okay. three months wow. So yeah, yeah, I took that's, it very. That's very obsession, yeah, yeah. obsession yeah. level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, that, like, to be honest, that that was also, like, that also helped me um, understand a little bit the power of programming because I was using, for example, I wrote like a PHP program to calculate, you know, what's gonna be my time in a few months if I mm -hmm. keep improving this way. So it wasn't only Excel, and I would generate like diagrams with like the goals and the progression and everything. Nice. So I was, I always took it very, you know, analytically. Yeah. Um, nice. So how has your relationship with sport changed since that uh, competitive period? Yeah, so I picked just uh, right before finishing high school. Mm -hmm. And after that, there was <laughs> downhill definitely. Okay. Because I, I tried to continue to swim in the Netherlands when I started my bachelor's, mm -hmm. but there I didn't find a club uh, mm -hmm. because they weren't doing fin swimming, which still was okay. I would have handled normal mm -hmm. swimming, mm -hmm. but the team was only Dutch speaking. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit difficult to integrate. Right. Okay. And then I kept, you know, doing sports, but only at a amateur level and not even that yeah. only, you know. So for you, was it very, 
was that decision very hard of having to leave Spain in favor of you know your studies versus continuing with professional sport in Spain plus doing your studies there? Was there a period where maybe you got disillusioned with your sport and then you thought, yeah, no, I'm just going to prioritize mm-hmm. my studies. This is not realistic. Or... At the time that I was finishing high school, I, I already made my mind that I wanted to pursue, you know, the, the more uh, academic environment rather than athletic one. Mm-hmm. But um, it was never a hard decision. Like when I was younger, I wanted to be, you know, a professional fin streamer or in general uh, athlete. Mm-hmm. But uh, as, as you know, as I started going through the later years of high school, I I already knew that I was passionate about uh, programming and in general engineering and science, and I wanted to to exploit that yeah. further. And I, I, it wasn't a difficult decision for me. I really wanted to go abroad, so okay. uh, I really liked my friends at the time and yeah. how everything was uh, my life in Spain. Yeah, yeah. But still, I was I was looking forward to go abroad. So okay. I wouldn't say it was a difficult decision. So I'm I'm just taking a wild guess here, but <clears throat> was this desire to go abroad sparked by your the international competitions that you attended or was there another reason that you had this interest that as well but it was mostly that i felt that i i I wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone i wanted to do something uh, different like game changing you know i I really wanted to find my limits not this time in the athletic domain but Mm -hmm. in the more scientific domain so i I really wanted to push myself in in that sense and you know go to a different country where you don't know other people and you know start your life from scratch i was yeah i was excited about that wow it it just seems like given you know the the small town that you came from we have actually very similar stories like not a lot of people around us were doing the same thing but i have my parents like my parents both studied abroad um and you know we come from a quite international family yeah. but in your case it's like really grounded in spain right <laughs> well so, my mother is from belgium uh, but still true. she's yeah she she's from belgium but then she moved to spain but she's only she's not international she she was born and raised in belgium from like a yeah. old time flemish okay. <laughs> family and my father the same but in spain um but yeah so i was okay. you know the first to you know to go abroad and then, you know, also transition to other countries after the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my, my parents didn't have a higher education, so it was also the first, you know, oh, of wow. the family. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. And um, how much did you consider that, like going abroad to a university uh, like Delft versus uh, university like UPC in, in Barcelona. Yeah, I, I had plan A and plan B and plan A was the health and plan B was uh, okay. University of Barcelona. Okay. So I didn't have even more options. I just found <laughs> out about this uni in the Netherlands that apparently was pretty good and I really liked at the time, aerospace sounded like something I wanted to learn more because I couldn't find it on YouTube. <laughs> but so it wasn't like programming, which yeah. I could find on YouTube. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, those were my two options, and I really wanted to go on the, to Delft, you okay. know. But but my plan B, I was still happy about it. So. so how how did you change during your time in Delft? Do you um, remember? feeling a transformation inside of you, did did, did that experience um, bring to surface some some things about yourself that you didn't know, like some strengths or weaknesses? Um, Yeah, definitely I I struggled a little bit in the beginning because my English at the time was very weak. So I mostly made Spanish friends or Spanish speaking friends Mm -hmm. or the ones that were not Spanish speaking. Uh, you know, I had very superficial <laughs> conversations okay. with them, uh, but I, I I noticed that I really changed as a person, not so much because I became independent, which I sort of was already before going to the Netherlands, um, but more because, you know, I was in a different country that I knew nothing about and I was surrounded by people that were in the same spot. Um, and, you know, I, I got a lot of inspiration from my friends. Uh, my friends in the Netherlands were, were awesome and we went through through the journey together, and yeah, I mean, you can imagine I was born and raised in a small town. A lot of things that, 
you know that i i was looking back i i was very innocent about you know and and those years were uh, to grow not only as a professional but also as a person you know mm -hmm. mm. okay so then you know you're you're kind of uh, painting a very positive experience in delft especially with the friends you had made there um but eventually after your three years right of bachelor you decided to make a switch again in your life in terms of location and also actually uh, the, the field of study. Mm -hmm. um, so you came to ETH to do robotics for your master's and uh, I'm, I'm wondering when did that decision um, start as a seed in your brain? Uh, when did you first find out about ETH and about the robotics program here? Um, yeah. yeah, so... Mm Already before starting my bachelor's on aerospace, I knew that I was into programming. And so I, I still chose aerospace because at the time I felt like I could really learn anything online when it comes to programming, whereas for aerospace that wasn't true. But, um, but after a few years of aerospace, um, even though I really enjoyed aerospace and uh, like as a science it's super interesting, I could notice that maybe if I want to specialize in something that has to be more um, programming and I say programming in general but at the time I started learning a lot on AI not so much on robotics but the software side and uh, so I, I learned a lot of courses on AI and then I did a minor in Singapore also on AI and mathematics and at the time it became clear that I wanted to to switch from either space to um, to to more software oriented yeah. career and robotics systems and control at ETH uh, look like the perfect uh, solution for that. Um, again, not because I wanted to leave the Netherlands, but because I wanted to push myself out of my comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. So that was the decision behind it. Okay. Yeah, I, I honestly think the minor of the the Delft Aerospace Bachelor is such a such a great initiative. It is because there's so many people that decide to then change yeah. uh, their their major uh, based on that minor. Myself included, I had basically the same uh, same waking up moment during my minor of wow, software engineering is really cool. Yeah, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, and not only for realizing what you like, but also for you know it's very appealing for for like mentally to learn about something different. You know. You have to imagine you've been two and a half years or two years learning about the same things mm -hmm. and you're you've been exploiting a lot you're like you've been digging very deep into in our case aerospace mm -hmm. and it feels so satisfying to learn a lot uh, not diving a lot but you know broad exploration on a new topic is like wow now i'm now into this new world yeah, yeah, yeah. and look at this this is amazing yeah, so. yeah, yeah. exactly because if you read a paper or you go to a lecture suddenly 80% of the material is new versus exactly. if you're in aerospace, you've heard like yeah. so many things are basically repeated between yeah. courses or mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a, yeah, the, the steep learning curve kind of drops off yeah. a bit. I know that if it wasn't because, you know, I want to prepare myself as a pro professional and I want to specialize, mm -hmm. I know that I would spend all my time learning about different things. I, I wouldn't okay maybe some things i would like to dive a little bit more but in general i would just like to learn about humanities and then engineering and then this uh, physics degree and you know just yeah. switching constantly what, what would have been your alternative for the masters actually um when you applied when you were thinking of applying so i i applied to mit um oxford i think yeah oxford and uh, eth but it was the the three um, tracks were the same were robotics and maybe mit or oxford were were not exactly robotics but the software side so more like optimization and ai mm -hmm. um, so yeah but they're also I, all very hard to yeah get into. Like, yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah assume that you're gonna i i got rejected both of mit and oxford um but luckily i got into eth so i'm, I'm still happy about otherwise that. you would have stayed in delft and um, yeah, my again, my last plan was to stay in Delft and we st we still, still have been happy, you know, glad to that I made it to ETH, yeah. but still. So you've told me in the past in our conversations that you that you can see yourself living in Zurich mm -hmm. uh, in, the f in some some hypothetical future. Um, why is that? Uh, why do you like this this place? Um, I mean, why, why wouldn't I like it, you know? It's, a, it's an amazing place. I, I mean, it depends, of course, on your preferences. And there's no such thing as a perfect city, of course. 
Uh, for example, like for me, the, in winter it gets too cold and too dark maybe, yeah. even though it's not as bad as in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, I find it, uh, you know, the, the standard of living here is uh, very high. There are a lot of professional opportunities. And most importantly, you're surrounded by, by people that, uh, at least on a personal level, inspire me. So I, I want to be surrounded by, by these kind of people. At least I'm, I'm talking about myself, of course. Mm -hmm. And in, in Switzerland, I mean, I really like the country because you're surrounded by nature. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of things that I like here. But um, having said that, I, um, yeah, even though I like Zurich, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know, open to, again, push myself out of, out of my comfort zone and go to a next city. Again, I don't think there's a, a, such a thing like a perfect city. It's rather, you know, that... The, 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 what you gain is not on the goodness of a city, but rather the, what you learn of it. Mm -hmm. And you learn more if you switch more often, yeah. I, I imagine. Right. Also the fact that we're limited by our sample size. So yeah. <laughs> you can only compare with what you've seen. Exactly. And yeah. And you don't know what's out there. The exactly. exploration, and, exploitation. Yeah. And there are so many things that I miss in the Netherlands. You know, the, the going like uh, going by bike everywhere, you know, or, or the culture in so many aspects. And in Spain, the weather, the, the, the social life, the, the you know, the, yeah. the, the environment that you have there. There's things to enjoy everywhere. So, yeah, I wouldn't put any city on top of any other. So, speaking about new adventures, uh, I want to switch to talk about a company you've been involved with and you're going to continue to be involved with and is going to be your next adventure and is going to actually drive you away from the ring for a while. <laughs> pretty <least>. far, pretty <laughs> far. <laughs> yeah. um, and that is a company called Zipline. Yes. Um, so, how did you first hear about it and what, what made you apply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a long story, but I remember, it, I think it was during my first year in aerospace and I was checking YouTube videos from a channel, it's called Real Engineering. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned about this company that was using drones to deliver medical supplies in Africa. And they were delivering uh, especially medical supplies uh, and especially blood bags. So for example, you can imagine when a mother is giving birth, then they send a drone with a bag of blood to the place where the person is. She will normally be in a hospital, but the problem is that in there, the hospitals don't have a supply of blood mm -hmm. because blood has a very short expiration date. So if they would keep their own supply, they, it would expire very often. So what they do is they, they centralize the supply of blood and then they deliver from there to the hospitals in which they are needed. So when I learned about that, I was mind blown because it was the dream company for me because on the one side, um, it was very challenging from an engineering standpoint, uh, but on the other side, for me, it was very fulfilling, you know, to, to be part of a project that, that could do that. And I remember as soon as I watched the video, first thing is I sent it to my best friend and he also was like mind blown. And then the second thing we did was to apply and we both got rejected because of course we were on the first year of our first bachelors year. with no experience at all. But yeah, long story, like fit forward three mm -hmm. years and um, I did an internship there mm -hmm. and I really liked my, the experience there. I was very happy with, you know, you know, with the company, with the culture of the company, with the team yeah. and, and yeah, I'm and very excited. And they were excited. happy with you. <laughs> and they were happy with me. So we, we made it long term. <laughs> we made it official. <laughs> uh, so yeah, now after I finish my master's degree, which is soon to be finished, I will, I will fly to San Francisco. I didn't, I didn't mention. So the company mm -hmm. is in San Francisco, mm -hmm. even though they operate in Africa. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I will, it was, it's going to be my first full-time job. So, right. So. Your master thesis is about to finish, like literally uh, next week. almost finished next week. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and next month, in, yeah, at the start of September-ish, you're going to... Well, start of October. Start of October, yeah. you're going to go to first to Africa, right? Yeah, actually. So they have this very cool program that is that for new employees, they, if you want, they let you go to Africa, mm -hmm. uh, to Rwanda and to Ghana, which are the two countries uh, in which their operations are largest. Mm -hmm. And they have this program called Zipline Academy mm -hmm. and that you can learn about how operations work. So this is very useful for you to understand how can you improve the life of the operators 
as an engineer in Silicon Valley, you know, in yeah. your office that you have no context yeah. on what's going on. So you can't empathize with them. Exactly. And it's, it's not only a matter of practicality, but also a matter of, you know, you, you want to, to get in touch with your customers. You know, yeah. you want to know why are you developing this mm -hmm. thing? And also it's probably to have conversations, not only with the operators of the drone, but with the end customers, which are the doctors mm -hmm. and the patients. So that to me is a very important part of the picture. Yeah. Because so far you have not interacted even through a call with the people in Uganda or? Um, during my interview process, I had like a, a call uh, with, with a few, but not, not, I have never gone to Africa. So, okay. So. But during your internship, you didn't have to correspond with uh, people on site? There, yeah, or? of course. But yes, but it, it was always um as a like from a professional standpoint and al al always because we had something to discuss so for example on every mondays we have yep. the all hands meeting yeah. and most of the times is discussing some operations uh, that is going on and you get to learn about you know what are the issues that are facing uh, and most of it is centered in Africa, so I get to learn a lot, mm -hmm. but is this is not comparable to, you know, me going to Africa and actually seeing the drones fly and seeing, talking to the operators and understanding, you know, how it's making an impact, not only in the patients, but even the communities there. And, you know, yeah. also think that it's, they're employing a lot of locals there. So, you know, it's, it's not only the, the product being delivered, but a company based there that it's, it's making a lot of impact. Right. Yeah, yeah. both providing value to, to normal people, but also to people that want, yeah. a, want a job. Um, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so going back just to your application story. So you first applied, got rejected. Then you applied again, like, what, two years, three, three years, years later? Three years later, yeah. Okay, so basically the, the, all the experience you gained during your aerospace bachelor was what made the difference, you would say, right? Yes, I guess so. And also, I mean, probably uh, at the time, they not only I didn't have the experience, but maybe they were not looking yeah. for, like the stars have to align. Maybe yeah. this time I was very lucky also yeah. that they were looking for exactly this position. Right, what was the position? Uh, actually, so I applied for embedding, so um, embedding <laughs> engineer, embedded software, embedded software yeah. Wow. Um, and at the time I thought I would like it, but then during the interview, uh, it was clear that that wouldn't, be in, that wouldn't have been a good uh, fit. Both uh, ways. Both ways. Pretty much nothing. But I, I mean, I was so passionate about the company that mm -hmm. that I still wanted to apply, and it was the only opening in the website. That's why I, okay. I did that. But I had an interview with a person, and we both figured out that it would be better to transfer to another team, mm. uh, which is called Behaviors, but it's basically like automation team. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, then they switched me to this other team, and I had the whole interview process in the other team. But that other team didn't have a vacancy, or did they? Uh, well, they didn't have an opening in the website, uh, but I guess they were still open to okay. hire. I, I mean, I, I would say most companies, what they want is to acquire talent, talent you know, yeah. they, they don't... I mean, they, they have these openings online because sometimes they really want a position, yeah. but for the rest of time, maybe they don't want to hire, but if the opportunity yeah. presents itself, then I see. I don't know. I'm not an expert on right, that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, when you joined them, how big was the company and how big is it now? Huh, that's a good question. It, it grew a lot. I mean, I joined there last summer and now this summer, um, I don't know the numbers, but in yeah, at the time it was 600 employees in total considering you know the operators in Africa go to market mm -hmm. uh, HR the engineers in San Francisco the whole team was around 600 I don't know what it is now but it's probably uh, very close to a thousand if not more and when it comes to engineer as well I think it has doubled or so so at the time it was not like close to 200 and now it must be much more than wow. that and another question about when you applied did you at that point know that it was going to be a remote internship or not? So uh, at the time, I thought it was going to be uh, an on-site internship. Okay. I, I had a few negative experiences where I, I got almost the role for, for that I was looking for. But then because uh, it was uh, during COVID, so all visas were canceled, sort of my internship was also canceled. But I was very lucky that Zipline didn't do that to me. So they said, look, we cannot fly you there because visas are canceled, mm -hmm. but at least we're going to allow you to do the, the online internship. And of course, I also had to accept the terms that I was 
I'm gonna take it. <laughs> okay. So so yeah, I, I mean, better than nothing, but it would have been even better to visit mm -hmm. the team there. Even though I had the chance to visit them in January this year. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what were the best and worst things, would you say, about the remote side yeah. of the internship? The, the worst thing is that you're a bit more distant from everything, you know, like you're in a different time zone and you're, you, you, you sort of want to be independent because you don't want to work in their same time zone. You, will, you don't want to go to bed at 2 a.m., you know, yeah. so I want to work in my time zone and... Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was still, considering this, I was still very lucky that I, I, I felt part of my team and, you know, yeah, it, it wasn't the worst, but yeah, the time zone is, is a struggle. So mm -hmm. it's definitely worse than working online for a company that is in the same time zone. Like the time zone company yeah, really yeah. makes it more difficult. Okay. How long was your internship and, and what, what kind of projects did you work on during mm -hmm. that time? So my internship was, I would say, five months or so. Okay. But after that, they, they offered me the position that I ended up taking now, but before finishing my master's degree. Uh, and I didn't take it because I wanted to actually finish my master's degree, but I continued to work part-time as a contractor. Mm -hmm. And so I did the internship from May to, I think it was September or mm -hmm. so. And then after that, uh, part-time until I started my master's thesis. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to work full time from October onwards. Okay. Okay. And sorry, and, and the, the projects, projects that I got yeah. involved, uh, I cannot talk a lot about, you know, the nature of the projects, but uh, what I can say is that um, I, I was in the behaviors team, which is the automation. So you can think that I was working on algorithms to uh, avoid two drones conflicting into each other. So it's it's mostly working on automation software that um, you know, allows uh, for traffic decongestion. So not even avoiding vehicles, but making sure that we don't run into a situation in which there are a lot of vehicles together. Mm -hmm. So it's not vehicle, not only vehicle to vehicle deconfliction, but actually maintaining like a healthy network of, of drones that are in the sky. Okay, so spread out density. Yeah, okay. but density, but also aligning the drones, you right. know, so yeah. Okay, cool. Obviously, during your internship, you made a good impression because they, they extended your contract. So I'm kind of wondering, what, what do you think made you stick out? I guess I was lucky that they handed me a project that I was very passionate about. So mm -hmm. the one word is passion. You know, okay. I, when you're passionate about something, you, you just not only you work better and more, but you're also more creative. You, mm -hmm. you, you, like you really have ownership of your project. Okay. Um, so I, I, I guess what they liked is that I, you know, I, I really excelled at the project that I was given. Given, of course, there were a lot of things that I didn't do perfectly or, or that didn't end up working well. The part that I liked is that it was a, um, you know, from scratch project okay. that actually had a lot of impact on, mm. on the later stages of the development of the project that other engineers are working on now. Okay. So it, it was like a big project, to maybe not a big project, but a project to start from scratch that will later influence the development of the, the of the drone mm -hmm. um and yeah the 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 project in specific was again i cannot talk about the details but a simulation project so i okay. i designed a simulation where you could visualize the trajectories of a lot of drones and implemented algorithms for them to deviate going towards the the end of this part-time work um did you expect that you were gonna get job offer um what i don't know did you get any clues from your supervisor <laughs> that they they were like oh yeah you're performing really well um, I, uh, maybe i got a few clues but I, I tried not to think too much about it okay. um so so yeah it, it caught me by surprise uh, one day it was one of the happiest days because <laughs> the the nothing less than the cto of zipline actually like I was actually working with the city of Zeebline, which yeah. is an amazing engineer. You, you, you're a user of Ross. He was one of the creators of Ross. So mm -hmm. I felt one of the gifts of my internship was that I got to to have a few meetings with him. And he was the, the one, you know, I had a meeting with my supervisor and the CTO and they, they, they sort of offered me the, the role. So I was like, wow, this is super cool. Right. And, you know, um, the only pity is that they what they offered me was a full time position, but right away, and I didn't want to take that because I was in the middle of my of my master's degree, mm -hmm. so I first wanted to finish my master's degree. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't say it's uncommon. I think 
companies want to have interns because it's a way for them to actually understand, you know, or, you know, it's a probation. It's, exactly. Yeah. It, it's like a very long interview process. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, I'm definitely not an outlier. I would say that a lot of people yeah. do the same thing. So, right. yeah. Okay. So the contract now is for at least one year or for, and yeah, so uh, it's complicated because I'm going to be a res well, I'm going to have to move to the U S so if the contract is limited by something, it's especially visas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but for now it's full time. So Simpline, as far as I understand, started as this uh, emergency healthcare delivery yeah. company, logistics, right? logistics company. Uh, for for emergency situations in remote places like Uganda. Mm -hmm. But um, I've seen uh, on the website that now they're moving into the U.S. market, not only for healthcare but also for. Um, for retail. Mm -hmm. So has this been in the works for a while already uh, internally and um, how separate are these two applications on a technical mm -hmm. level? Like are you working in different teams? Are you um, you know sharing the software stack for most of it? How, you know? There are different uh, mm, approaches. So Zplane is expanding and one of the ways it's expanding is by sort of uh, applying the same approach that is uh, doing in Africa, but other in other parts of the world, and then you also have the power by Zipline approach, which is that they actually sell the drone mm -hmm. to, for example, another company that then can use it uh, for their own purposes. That that is sort of like an exploration that they are okay. doing, uh, but it's it's not like a big part of of Zipline yet. The mm -hmm. power by Zipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I wouldn't say you have the team split in, in, in two. I, I think most of the processes are the same, especially when it comes to the drone. So the drone mm -hmm. it serves the same purpose, delivering one thing than another. And, but what is very important about this is to evaluate it in terms of the mission. It's something yeah. that I've been meditating a lot because what drove me to Zipline was mm -hmm. the humanitarian aspect of it, you know, that it's delivering medical supplies. Um, so them expanding to other markets is something that I've had to, 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 to think about, you know, because um, even though they're going to increase, like they're going to keep increasing the number of medical supplies and emergency medical supplies, they're going to do other things that, um, you know, make it, maybe, maybe they, they make me feel that the essence is not anymore medical supplies, but they've been putting a lot of effort into making sure that there's like the mission is still the same. So the reason why they're expanding is of course, because of unit economics, you cannot, um, you're, you cannot, if you're not profitable in the lo long run, you cannot uh, keep doing these medical mm -hmm. deliveries, which is not that they are not profitable, but in order to drive down the cost, you have to scale right. up. Right. And the only way to scale up is to grow in space, but also in the use cases of your right. product. So there is no other way to, to improving unit economics and scaling up okay. to actually benefit the yeah. end customers. So this is, um, I think that, you know, I have to reason about, but in, in reality, it really makes sense. It's, yeah. it's something that it's, it, it's aligned with the mission, you know, yeah. it's, it's for improving the mission. I was wondering to what degree the zipline system is automated and how much human manual labor is required mm -hmm. to to have it running mm -hmm. and you know um, where where you see improvement. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of areas to improve. Maybe in automation we can be very proud of where we are because uh, from the moment that the drone takes off to the moment that it's uh, hooked up, hooked up yeah, on on the on the hook. yeah it's on the air. Cool <laughs> yeah, I encourage people to yeah, watch yeah. Uh, how how the drone lands. Yeah, I don't know uh, if there's something on the on the website. But mm -hmm. do you think there is on the main um, page? How in, they, they changed the website oh, recently, so. Is this it? No. Okay, well, I can't find it. But yeah, uh, um, okay. maybe you can describe it with words. Yeah, so. Uh, for the drone to take off, it's really interesting because normally uh, the drone, by the way, looks like a tiny airplane. So it has fixed wings and normally airplanes have a runway to take off, but that would require to, to actually build a runway. And we don't want to do that in every center at which we operate, of course. So what we do is we have a, a, a ramp that it's uh, at, a, at an angle mm -hmm. and then it's sort of a catapult <laughs> so the, the the drone just launches and gains speed on the ramp and then it's let free so that's how the drone takes off and then to deliver the package 
instead of the drone or the, the tiny airplane, if you want to call it, actually uh, landing and then delivering the package, what it does is that it deploys a parachute mm -hmm. that contains the payload. Mm -hmm. um, and because they are light payloads, it's still fine to, to be handled by a parachute. And it's mm -hmm. a paper parachute, by the way. Okay. And then for the drone to land instead of landing, which again, you would need a runway, mm -hmm. uh, what the engineers designed, this was way before I joined the team, it's, it's one of the things that caught my attention, yeah, yeah. is that um, so they, the, while the drone is flying, it sort of has like a hook uh, on the tail, and then they deploy a string that sort of picks up the, the drone in the sky uh, while it's flying, and this... Uh, and the, 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 yeah, the, the string is elastic, so it allows for like a slow deceleration and then it falls. Well, it doesn't fall, but it hangs from the sky mm -hmm. and then the operators remove it from the hook and then onto the next uh, okay. drone. So the operators are basically in charge of putting, uh, of picking the right payload, putting it on the drone, on mm -hmm. that launcher thing, yeah. <laughs> and then picking up the drone from the hook. Exactly. I mean, there's so much more to the process that I still have to figure out when I go to yeah. Africa. That's yeah, the, right. the, the main purpose. And of course, there are also operators that are, they are not literally driving the drones or operating them, mm -hmm. but they can give high level commands. Like for example, return to the nest, which is the center where they launch or these kind of commands. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I guess the dream is to miniaturize this as I guess as much as well, I don't I don't know if if that's if that would be possible. But given that you have a pretty compact la launching and landing system, you would basically almost be able to have like remote stations where there's almost no no human operator, right? Mm -hmm. And that way you can have units almost anywhere in these remote places. Um, but I don't know if that's feasible given that the payload needs to be. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer the question because, again, I have to learn so much about the operations side of it that I, I don't know. I don't even know what's the direction that they're trying to head. You know, right. I, I don't I, I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, but super interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so cool. Um, OK, so now I want to turn to something completely different, super unrelated to zipline, mm -hmm. um, but it's very related to your mind <laughs> where your mind wanders yeah. uh, and that is a project that you worked on for for a few months and uh, not so long ago called nash judge um mm -hmm. which i believe you coined that term right i think so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean nash is a personal Na name um, and judge yeah, as well, judge. but you put them together <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so um yeah and you you basically developed an idea for or um, it's a, a new incentive a structure for global to promote global cooperation right yeah. and you developed this idea by means of a white paper and a very very beautiful <laughs> YouTube video with I put a lot of amazing effort. animations <laughs> yeah. uh, that make the idea really really clear so I would, mm -hmm. I, I'll have links to that in the show notes Thank you. for anyone that's interested I would really recommend mm -hmm. uh, looking into it but maybe we can hear from the man himself about <laughs> yes. what, what this is all about. Yeah, so maybe I first introduce what the problem is and then the, yeah, the solution sure. that I propose sure. to the problem. So, um, so what's the problem? The problem is that in the status quo, the world is structured in nations and nations are trying to maximize their own individual utility mm -hmm. and to a certain extent disregarding the utility of other nations. Mm -hmm. And this system is what we call nationalism. This is the system in which the world is structured. And, you know, I'm not here to criticize the system. It has some advantages that, for example, the competition between nations, in a way, one aspect of it is healthy because it encourages uh, innovation. You know, it's a competition that acts as an optimization mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has a lot of negative aspects as well. And mainly the, ne the main negative aspect is that it's an incomplete system because it's not designed to solve global problems. It's very well designed to solve national problems but not so much global problems. And you can think of global problems as problems that require cooperation between nations. So one example can be climate change. Another example can be, um, you know, incentivizing peace. So preventing conflict between nations in the form of violence or in the form of economic conflicts. Or you can think, um, if you're not interested in any of this, you can think of, for example, how should governments or nations cooperate 
to promote legislation to prevent harmful technology to harm us in the future. You know, these global regulations, there, there are things that we should be regulating on a global basis mm -hmm. um, because of the same problem that I will comment now. So, um, so why are these problems not solved by nationalism? The reason is that from a game theory perspective, even though I will try to describe it with normal words, mm -hmm. you can think that a global problem cannot be solved by nationalism because if a nation or a government is trying to, for example, maximize its own utility, for example, when it comes to climate change, uh, most of the times in the short term, the rational decision, rational being improve your own utility, uh, for example, when it comes to climate change, is to actually not fight against climate change. Why? Because if you fight against climate change and the other countries, or if you don't have the trust that the other countries will do the same, then you end up being the only one that invested a lot of effort into fighting against climate change, but the other countries didn't do the same. And uh, because of that inability of governments to cooperate, uh, then these, these problems are, are very difficult. I, I'm not saying that they're uh, unsolvable, mm -hmm. but they're definitely much more difficult to solve under nationalism. Mm -hmm. So um, there have been a few solutions proposed in the past, the main one being one defended by a lot of intellectuals, which is to have some sort of central world government and people think that it would be like a, a like authoritarian government with a lot of power over a lot of things. But the idea would be that this central government would be um, sort of in charge of managing only global problems, mm -hmm. climate change, these kind of problems. Um, and then what this world government would be, would be doing would be to impose an incentive structure on governments to cooperate. And this translates to rewarding them if they are being cooperative and sanction them in, if they are being defective. You know, if they are not fighting against climate change, then they receive a, a sanction. Mm -hmm. And this incentive structure is everything you, well, maybe not everything, but it's really what you need. You need countries to be incentivized to cooperate right. because if they are incentivized to cooperate, then the rational mm, action or decision to make is the one that is actually aligned with the global, uh, with the common good, you know, mm -hmm. with the good for the rest of the world. So what you need is an incentive structure. Now, the solution that I propose is different than the central world government um, in a lot of aspects. Uh, but the, the main reason why it's different is because instead of being a top-down approach, instead of relying on a central government, it relies on a bottom-up approach. Why is this better? It's better because a top-down approach is really unattainable because all governments in the world would have to agree to be ruled by a superior government they would have to agree on what is the, the sanctions and rewards that they receive, by which channels are they imposed, um, you know, on, on what basis are they imposed, and, and a lot of things that uh, we don't see happening in the near future. So even though it could be a potential solution, it's unattainable. What I'm proposing is a bottom-up incentive structure. And the way this works is the following. So what I propose is to use blockchain technology to create create tokens that are specific for every government. Mm -hmm. So let's create this hypothetical world where we only have two governments. We have country A or mm -hmm. government A and government B. So then we also have token A and token B or B tokens and A tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have smart contracts, which are just programs that run on a blockchain that what they do is they, they control the supply of tokens so that they can influence the price of them. And these programs, what they do is that they make the price of the tokens be correlated with their uh, ability to cooperate. So for example, if the A government is more cooperative, then the price of the A token will be higher. And if the A government is defective, then the price of the A token will be lower. And the same for uh, government B. And then if you... This like the, this price you control by the scarcity or yeah amount. exactly by the supply which yeah. is the scarcity of okay. it so more supply is lower price mm -hmm. uh, fewer supply is higher price yes. i mean i explained this in the video of course yes. with a bit more detail and in the paper as well mm -hmm. but the idea is that you have these smart contracts that correlate the price of a token with the ability of its corresponding country to cooperate and then the second property is that you want to give uh, tokens at least to a high mm, proportion to their corresponding, corresponding governments. So you want that government A has a lot of A tokens and you want that government B has a lot of B tokens. And if these two properties are met, then something magical occurs, which is that we have an incentive structure. Why? 
because if country A has a lot of A tokens, it wants the value of A tokens to increase because they're going to become richer. And what do you have to do for the value of these tokens to increase? Well, you have to cooperate. You have to demonstrate your ability to cooperate mm -hmm. because the price of these tokens is correlated with your ability to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Um, so country A is going to be incentivized to cooperate because in this way the price of these tokens will be higher and is de-incentivized to defect because if he does, if they do that, the price of these tokens will be lower. Mm -hmm. And the same applies for country B. Mm -hmm. There is a third property that it's that the, 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 even though there's correlation, you also need the magnitude of these tokens to be high because of course if these tokens are worth 10 bucks, then the countries don't really mind about uh, right. so something as small as this. But if these uh, three properties exist, um, then um, something really interesting occurs. And I will explain it first in game theory terms and, yeah. and, and then in normal words, which mm -hmm. is that the, eff the effect of this is that you, um, you apply an offset in the matrix payout of individual governments in a way that aligns the Nash equilibrium with the common good. And what this means in normal words is that after that, the rational decision for every government is actually the one that is best for the rest of the world. So that's what you need to solve a global problem. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's how I would briefly describe the... Okay. the well, I know a lot to unpack. That was a long monologue. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, but I was following you. I think you explained yeah. it super eloquently. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've probably been pitching this for yeah. a while now. Um, so I just want to backtrack a bit so that yeah, I there's make a sure lot I understand. Um, so, okay, when you were talking about governments competing with each other, it sounds very akin to, you know, the capitalist model between companies, right? Mm, but companies yeah. have a unity above them, which is governments that allow these incentives to allow companies to actually do something e good for the world. Exactly, right? exactly. The problem is something good for the nation. <laughs> because, for the nation, yes. Because the, the nation, the, the nation right. is... Yes. The nation is to the companies what the world right. government would be to the nations. Right. You know, true, true, it's, true. it's a mechanism to impose an incentive structure to cooperate. Yeah, that's true. They 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 put taxes, they create regulations, and I said global good, but it's the national good. That's yeah. why there's mm -hmm. different regulations in yeah. different countries yeah. for the same company. Which is not to say that this is always unaligned what's no, best course. for the global. Sometimes and most of the times, even though we like to criticize capitalism. Yeah it creates win-win situations where everyone gets benefited, yeah. even though that's always not the, the time. So it's mm -hmm. not always the case. Okay. But yeah, of course, the problem is that at some point there's nothing, no unit yeah, Exactly. Higher. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, of course, the natural thing would be say, would be to say, let's put a central unit yeah. above governments that access the nation acts towards yeah. companies. But you're saying that there's there's a problem with that, which I understand. Maybe uh, we will reach it one day, but today it seems unattainable. If if I can take a, a detour yeah. and show you the the evolution of of human societies, mm -hmm. in our early days we would uh, organize ourselves in little tribes, mm -hmm. and uh, in that those times we didn't have central government that would place an incentive structure. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of conflict. We, we were always fighting for food, fighting for limited resources, and there was a lot of blood spill until we managed to build uh, small communities that were organized and that where there were incentive structures. And we had like um, a small government and, and a small town. And this was the first time that, you know, we, we had a, a mechanism by which incentivized cooperation between individuals. The problem is that then we, we organized ourselves with little, we want to call it regions or, or towns. I mean, it was at different levels, different scales. Mm -hmm. But then you had a, a similar problem between communities. So you had different communities and these different communities were at constant war. You know, that's the period where you had a lot of wars, where every region or country were, you know, declaring war on each other because of the same thing. They didn't have uh, an incentive structure on top of them. And then we created sort of nations. But nation is a high, like a, a level higher in the hierarchy. Um, but it's always been through a lot of misery and, 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 and suffering that we've been able to, you know, increase the, the, this, you know, level of the abstraction. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Increase the level at which the incentives are placed. Yeah. But I, I think it will, it would happen 
I mean, if we make it uh, to, uh, you know, in, in the future, a, a lot more years, we will, we will develop something like it. Maybe it's not like I describe it now, but some form, if, if my solution is, is uh, for some reason, you know, uh, not the best, which might very likely not be, uh, but I'm sure we, we, there is no other way by which we can keep uh, progressing uh, as a society without attacking global problems because global problems are one of the main challenges that we need to address. You know, we, we can keep the best and our brightest engineers working on making our Uber arrive 30 seconds faster or our pizza second 20 seconds faster. But we have to realize that even though I'm not criticizing this, this is amazing. Uh, this is, th those are marginal improvements, right? They, like these are things that are uh, making our lives better, but we're forgetting about things that, are, that really place an existential risk in, in our societies. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that climate change has the, you know, that, that, that might destroy our society, but there will be pro problems in the future that might destroy, maybe completely not, not completely destroy the human race, but really cause a, a catastrophic outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, so we really require governments to cooperate between each other because otherwise, um, you know, something as nuclear energy could be, you know, the, the end of, of uh, civilization as, as we know it. So while you were giving your initial explanation about the, the, the project, the idea of Nash Judge, I could see two challenges. There's probably more um, mm -hmm. that you've yourself identified in the, in the white paper. Um, but I could, I could see two, which is... Uh, one, um, how do you uh, make sure that the value of these tokens is competitive with the value of regular money right mm -hmm. now? Right. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is, so as far as I understand, these smart contracts have the huge responsibility yeah. of uh, managing this uh, flow of mm -hmm. tokens, which in the end uh, drives the value of these mm -hmm. tokens. And so there's something in these smart contracts that is deciding what is what is uh yeah. good for for yeah, the planet, like who right? is being cooperative yes who yeah. is being cooperative and and that seems like yeah. such a difficult yeah. algorithm to yeah. design <laughs> uh, and, and even if you had a good algorithm it's 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 also an epistemology question you know mm. w what do we really know do we really know if a country is cooperative i'm going to be the first to admit that i'm talking about it as if it's something that you can quantify, but it's re really difficult to quantify because everyone will have different opinions mm -hmm. on the nature of a, the ability of a country to cooperate. Yeah. Um, so, of course, you can think that w one thing you can think of objective reality being there, but everyone interprets objective reality mm -hmm. in a different yeah. way. You know, everyone has mm -hmm. everyone perceives the world by a different lens. Mm -hmm. Um, so everyone has a, has a different perception, but also a different cognitive interpretation of what's happening. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not assuming that everyone will agree on what this cooperation uh, metric is. But what we can do is uh, some sort of law of large numbers where, uh, you know, when, when we ask the same question to a lot of people, then we, we combine the answers of everyone into a single metric that I'm not, uh, I'm not implying that it's close to objective reality, but it's probably our best approximation that, that we can give to it. You okay. know, it's like when, when you ask citizens of a country to vote, there will, everyone will be biased on the left or on the right or whatever spectrum you define. Mm -hmm. But what your hope is that is by combining the answers of everyone, you reach something that is actually useful. You yeah. use something that shows something about objective reality, even if you don't have access to it. Okay, so how do you how do you create a smart contract that basically like periodically you need to have these votes, right? Then mm -hmm. of yeah. of everyone on, yeah. like so, on a global scale you need Yeah, so I, I didn't answer these um I, I offer a few solutions, but I, I guess what I would like to say before proposing a solution is that my ideally what I would like to do is to inspire other people to offer solutions. I, I think I'm by no means uh, close to being an expert on any of these topics. In fact, it's something that I learned 
on the fly what I was reading in the paper. So I'm pretty sure that my solution is gonna be one of uh, the worst uh, <laughs> that, of the potential solutions to the problem. But uh, you can think of different approaches, right? Like you can think, for example, of a voting system where you're asking people to vote on you know do you think this country was cooperative you know do you think the invasion of this country on this other country is of a cooperative nature of our defective nature and again people will disagree everyone have different opinions uh, about anything i'm not denying that uh, but by combining answers you can arrive to something another uh, approach is to um to well to have some sort of uh, it's similar to what representative democracies are. You have people that elect the people that are in charge and then the people that are in charge that are experts, then they decide what are these metrics. But it's very difficult to design a system that has the right checks and balances, you know. It's very difficult to design a system that it's not corrupt, that, you know, it cannot be uh, manipulated or anything because, of course, if money is involved, people will try to exploit it. So, so there are different alternatives. One potential uh, approach is to have, have like a, a completely data-driven approach. For example, this would work a little bit more when it comes to climate change. So instead of letting a human decide if a country is being cooperative, then just measure the amount of CO2 emissions of a government or things that are more quantifiable. Mm -hmm. And then include all of this into a pipeline that at the end uh, comes up with a metric. So, you yeah, know. I mean, that, that feels more straightforward, mm -hmm. but then, you know, on a global level, you have to agree on these metrics and the weight of these metrics with yeah. respect to each other. And another thing is that it doesn't have to be the case that there's only one token per, go per um, country. Mm -hmm. You can have one token per country per problem uh, per or, or, or per, then, exactly. Okay. And then each of these will have a price that price. is correlated, you know, so okay. we don't have to make it... Uh, yeah. To, comp to weight the different, you know, things that we want to measure and combine them into one token. We can create tokens, one for CO2 emissions, another one for, you know, the, the, the peaceful nature of that yeah. country. Okay. You asked me another question. Yes, the other question was the how do the tokens themselves have a value large enough to actually... Yeah. Um, tip yeah. the the equation yeah. or the decision making. The, this is a um, this is something that I cannot prove. Like this is um, this is at the end, at the end of the day is a, a, a social contract. You know, like uh, things are valuable in a market not because they well a lot of times they have use value but most of the time they have exchange value which is that a thing is only valuable in a market because another person uh, defines it as valuable. I I I, I give value to a uh, paper bill which it's a has belief, right? exactly it's a shared yeah. belief and ultimately this thing has value because mm -hmm. um for example like you you can also say that money itself as an invention has value or like monetary system because it's a mechanism that allows us to first store value then exchange value and then account like measure the, the value of things so we mm -hmm. so that, that's something that it's an invention like money is an invention mm -hmm. that is useful for humans Mm, so at the end of the day, if something has a, a value to, to humans, then we can create a social contract, which is that something has value not in objective reality, but only as a product of human interaction, because it, it's able to solve a problem. And in this case, the problem would be global problems. But again, this is by no means a, a proof that you know it, it can reach a certain amount of value, that it's enough to change the decision making of governments mm -hmm. but it's it's the nature of saying uh, this at the end of the day would be a social construct i think i said social contract before i meant a social construct mm -hmm. which is something again that it doesn't live in objective reality just mm -hmm. a product of human interaction and if a thing is valuable if an invention is valuable at the end of the day well it, it, humans will perceive it as valuable so as an investor if I believe that this has the potential to change the world, if I believe that this can solve global problems, then I will probably think that the value will increase over time, that people will realize about this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then because I, I think that I'm going to invest now because um, the price will increase in the future. Whereas the opposite is also true. If I believe that this is uh, you know, definitely going to fail, then I'm going to sell it and the price is going to be lower. So at the end of the day, it drives down to the, the perception of people about this idea, if people are bullish or bearish. Yeah. Okay. 
And but I, I so should say, one route uh, is to convince investors. Yeah, but I, I should say that there is a, a distinction, an important distinction here, that it's not a productive asset. Most assets are productive, meaning if uh, you, for example, buy a company, this company is going to be productive, it's going to have some earnings, and uh, by buying part of this company, you'll also be receiving part of the earnings of this company. But this is a non-productive asset, which means that owning these tokens doesn't give you more tokens. So that, that's the, the distinction here. It's, uh, for example, you can think of a non-productive asset or, uh, for example, money is a non-productive asset. Owning money doesn't give you more money. Like the, the literally owning a bill. I'm not saying owning uh, the, the, the debt of other countries. So or owning a bill or a bond. Um, so it, there's a distinction there. It's like Bitcoin, for example, is also a non-productive asset. It doesn't give you more Bitcoins. So yeah. you only hold this kind of assets if you think that they're going to increase in value in the future. Right. So I'm just thinking like, um, for I'm, I'm looking for an analogy and I really don't know anything about this field, but in the process of globalization, there must have been moments where currencies had to, had to mix, right? Like mm -hmm. between countries. And we still have multiple different currencies, like many, mm -hmm. <laughs> many more than I can count. So how, how did they agree on a way of trading between each other? Do you know? How you, you know the exchange rate for from a dollar to a euro or? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so this is set by a market. There is a demand for dollars and a supply of dollars. The supply is normally controlled by central governments and also the, pri the private banking industry. And they control the supply of US dollars. So there's a supply of the US dollars and there's a demand of US dollars. You know, mm -hmm. uh, people want to buy US dollars to then uh, sell products. Um, so there's this supply and demand and there's also a supply and demand of euros. So at the, at the end of the day, there's, there's a supply and demand for each of these assets and it's a market sets the exchange rate. So okay. for example, now that the interest rates in the US are increasing, the demand of US dollars is increasing. And this means that US dollars are becoming more expensive relative to euros. And it's just the market that it's like, it's not that an algorithm is changing mm. the price. It's just that people are willing to pay more euros for a dollar than okay. before. So it's, it's the free market that does that. Okay. So, um, so I want to understand you, you were studying the same as me, you know, we've both studied aerospace, then we did robotics. Um, how was this idea born? <laughs> Where did this come from? And how, I mean, you mentioned that you learned every, most of it, uh, while researching mm -hmm. yeah. this idea further, but why? How was it born, and why did you decide? To yeah, to be honest, I couldn't. I couldn't pinpoint like the, uh -huh. the place uh -huh. where the idea came. But I, I was. I've always been a little bit interested. I've taken a, a few open courses where mm -hmm. uh, courses on economics, you know, microeconomics, macroeconomics, also a lot of game theory. I studied. Um, I also learned about blockchain technology and you know different like I, I programmed a few smart contracts and try to understand how this technology works. So I had sort of like the very elementary basics on each of the main pieces of the puzzle. Um, uh, but then the, the idea itself, I, I, again, I couldn't pinpoint where it came, but I remember, I sort of remember the, where the inspiration came. Okay. Um, and I remember I was on, on a flight, I was flying from San Francisco to Boston, mm -hmm. and I was listening to the soundtrack of a movie called Munich, The, the Edge of War. And it's a movie that depicts the period in which Chamberlain was ruling in the UK prior to World War II. And he was desperately trying to prevent war from happening. And, um, and there's a scene of them, I was listening to the soundtrack and there's a, it reminded me to a scene of the movie where Chamberlain is in his garden and he tells his wife, I would gladly stand against this wall and be shot if that prevented war from happening. So he was trying to desperately prevent war from happening, you know, a global problem from happening. But he, he didn't find the solution. And, you know, it's not that this made me realize of the solution, but I was really trying to think, why do wars happening from a game theory standpoint? You know, like, yeah. why does it really happen? I, I, I know already, you know, I've studied game theory and I know why it happens. But I was trying to, to think, given that this happens and that it is definitely a game theory problem, 
how do we, if, if it's just a game theory problem, it, if, if it wasn't because of the game theory aspect, we could solve that problem, right? So why is it really that we have this problem? Mm -hmm. And since that, I, I sort of investigated, oh, maybe what we need is an incentive structure. And then I, you know, I, I learned a bit about yeah. how blockchain technology can help into yeah. that, but yeah. So currently, I think due to your thesis, you've kind of put this project on hold, right? So you, as far as I know, you wrote the, the white paper, you sent it to a bunch of different people that you knew and also people that you didn't know, mm -hmm. then you published the video. Um, and I'm wondering what, what's currently the status? Are you planning on continuing to work on it? or? What? Yeah, so I think I will continue to work on it as a side project, as the many more side projects that I've had before. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to make it my, my main work first and foremost because I'm not an expert, but also I, I don't have the time or resources to commit to it fully. But my intention with it initially was to just, you know, spread out the word and let others do whatever they want to do with it, with the project and, and try to contact, uh, you know, professors that are experts in the topic or in general experts. Mm -hmm. and, and I've done a little bit of that, but I, I definitely what, what I like what my next steps are going to be are just to uh, contact with experts on the field first to give me feedback, because I'm sure that there are a lot of things that have to be addressed. And, and second, to, to encourage them to do the same, right, to spread the word mm -hmm. and probably to actually put this into practice and create the, the the tokens in a blockchain yeah. and you know distribute them on a population yeah. that can you know that can demand yeah. or that can buy or sell these tokens yeah. so that they can be valued on a right. market so all of these things so how would you um because i guess something that would be really useful to show the power is to to do a pilot project that yeah. is at a, a smaller scale mm -hmm. right so how yeah. Can this be done? Actually, I mean, you, you asked a very important question on, you know, the mechanism that we use to uh, establish the cooperation score of countries. That per se would be a very challenging project. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you have this metric is actually a very small, very easy problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I myself, I have programmed sort of versions of these on, you know, blockchain programming language. Mm -hmm. I have I deployed one on a fake version of Ethereum mm -hmm. uh, where it sort of works. Um, but the, it's not only the programming side of it. It's like, for example, you have to have an initial supply in terms of you need this, you need someone to own these tokens and to, to provide some liquidity so that they can sell and buy these tokens. And the way that you spread these tokens in the beginning is very difficult because I could say, okay, I, I get to have all of the supply of tokens, you know, as the creator of it. Um, but then really, um, if there's only one person with this supply, um, how do you establish the price? Because it's not that you have people selling and buying these tokens. Uh, plus, it would be very unfair that one person has all of the supply. Then I can say, okay, I can let people buy these tokens if they demand uh, the tokens, but right now no one knows about the project. Mm -hmm. Another more ethical approach would be to, it's what's called airdropping these tokens, which is to just um, sort of, you can imagine the picture of deploying tokens from the sky to random people. This would be a more egalitarian way to distribute the tokens. But you want to, you want people that receive these tokens to, you know, they have to have a, um, an, well, a, an address, right? They have to have a private uh, public key that has, a, well, they have to understand how blockchain works and all this. So it, it's not uh, straightforward, you know, it's, it's not as easy as saying, okay, uh, I create this algorithm that drops tokens from the sky. Mm -hmm. I think having an helicopter that would do that would be easier, actually. <laughs> that drops uh, pen drives from the sky yeah. that have the private oh, public keys yeah. that you need to, to buy and sell these tokens. So we've reached my favorite part of the podcast, which are intuition-based questions. And I know you'll enjoy this part as well because yeah. you actually <laughs> have a podcast, right, called Nomads, where you discuss some of these fundamental existential questions <laughs> so i think you enjoy okay. thinking about this so does artificial intelligence worry or excite you <laughs> which one more definitely oh okay both i would say yes um i mean in my in my personal life mm -hmm. in my intellectual curiosity it mm -hmm. excites me yes um do I think that it's going to have net positive or net negative impacts? Mm -hmm. I That's would approach it as a probabilities, probabilistic question, you know, I, and I don't know about the probabilities, mm -hmm. but I know that if, if something is to, um, if something is to bring humanity to a better, 
level is AI and if something is to bring humanity to a worse level is also AI is gonna I'm, I'm talking about artificial general intelligence not mm-hmm. about you know improving the current state of of AI so something that it's really game changing and that it can solve problems on a different domain of topics and to a much uh, to, to a much greater extent to which humans can do uh, uh, today's so it's gonna definitely it would definitely change you know the, the nature of uh, jobs you know like what are here like what are we what should we dedicate our lives uh, to if we if if the service that we can provide to society as in the products and services we build is not required because we have robots and AIs that can do it much better than ourselves. Mm-hmm. We'd have to change the economic systems, we would have to change the ways in which organize society and, and all those things. But yeah, I'm definitely worried about, you know, the, the potential negative outcomes of it. So I, I love technology, as I told you, I'm very passionate about it, but that doesn't make me a person that is always positive about technologies. I think mm-hmm. they are very powerful tools, uh, both for the good and for the bad. So the same tool can be used for the good or for the bad. We've seen that with, with so many tools, with nuclear energy, with social media and so many more. So. Um, that brings me to the next topic again, sorry to plug it again, but that's why it's so important to have uh, good incentive structures because the effects of a technology are not so much on the technology itself, but the, the, the use that we make of it. So the way we align mm-hmm. the incentives of the, the people that use t- this technology with the common good. Mm-hmm. So we want to make sure that the, whoever is using this technology in the future has incentives that are aligned with, with the common good. Mm-hmm. So, what is your what is your explanation for uh, Fermi's paradox? So the reason why I think I mean I've heard so many answers to this, <laughs> yeah. and of course I'm not Which one do you buy? I'm not making them no, no, uh, no, myself. No, so um, it can be that um, first, n- whenever an intelligent society becomes very developed, uh, as as I was saying before. Um, its ability to auto-destruct themselves or maybe not auto-destruct but bring themselves to you know a, a different form of life that it's not materialistic then this implies that whenever a techno- uh, civilization is very intelligent then it sort of disappears uh, mm-hmm. from the materialistic universe and this yeah. is why we haven't seen that yeah. so you can think of it as the big filter that every time a civilization becomes very intelligent then they go through this filter and they disappear and that's why we we haven't encountered this so other mm. destruction other destruction could be one another one could be that um well the universe is so big um and, and you know so, so large in space and, and in time that if if you think about this very high dimensional space mm-hmm. uh, it's like there might exist many more civilizations but they are so far that even if they are trying to reach us uh, you know we, we haven't yet received their signals okay. and another one can be that you know they they, they could be so much more intelligent uh, that for us is not we're not cognitively adapted to perceive their signals so maybe they are just right here right now but it's the same way that if i wave to a, an ant you know if i wave to an ant uh, you know my three-dimensional understanding of the world i know what i'm doing i'm waving to an ant but the ant doesn't know what's going on she's just wandering uh, around and she, probably she observe a disturbance in you know above her or something but the, she doesn't interpret she probably maybe she does i'm not <laughs> I, I don't, i'm not who to say <laughs> maybe she knows i'm a human but yeah. maybe it's just a, a disturbance in, disturbance in space that she the, the, she doesn't know how to interpret so mm-hmm. that the same thing could be applying yeah. uh, to us there are so many theories there right. i don't want to list them all yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking of one which i haven't actually heard before um so when you were talking about the threshold or like, yeah, the threshold of, of intelligence reaching a point where you can auto destruct yourself, I was thinking of it like you reach a point of intelligence and technological maturity where you can create a metaverse that does not, you basically don't want to live in reality anymore. Yeah, exactly. That, you convert yourself to impro- information processing, yeah, basically. Yeah. So you don't live in the materialistic world. Or maybe you live in a materialistic world, but your consciousness is rendered in a yeah. non-materialistic world. Yeah, so. essentially, yeah. You, you live in a world that you perceive as much better yeah. than the real one, so a digital world, and you have no 
no interest in, in continuing to explore the universe yeah, at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. with, with things happening <laughs> around the metaverse or, or, now. Or it could be that the desire to explore is something that you experience only up until a certain level of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there, as you said, you're, you're then chilling in, your, yeah. in the, the pocket of space and time at which you find yourself yeah. in the universe, but you, you don't go on to explore yeah. other spaces. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it could be that, that, that everyone else has figured out that this universe sucks and that they yeah. can create much better ones <laughs> exactly. for themselves. Yes, yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I guess exploit their biological uh, systems yeah. that yeah. they embody. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're cognitively adapted to imagine all of the reasons why we haven't <laughs> yeah. encountered these <laughs> things. What would you say is the coolest robot or artificial <laughs> intelligence on Earth? <laughs> AI, I mean, every, it, it goes so <laughs> every fast. Week every week answer, I'm going to change. Yeah. Now I'm going to say I'm, I'm struggling between co-pilot and mm -hmm. Dali, Dali 2. Okay, uh, yeah. So should I describe them briefly? Yeah. Maybe so co-pilot is this very, uh, it's one of these exciting but uh, things that I'm fearful, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, I, that I'm afraid about. So co-pilot is um, a tool that you can use that suggests you uh, code, basically. So you write a prompt which, uh, for example, says write a function that does this and that, and then it auto-generates the code. So it's something that it's very exciting, that it, but it's probably going to take my job <laughs> in, a, in a few years. But it's, it's again, as a per, from a personal standpoint, it's, it's amazing to see that, like, for, from an intellectual curiosity standpoint, you know, it's yeah. just mind-blowing that this works. I'm not saying that it has positive benefits. And the second one is uh, DALI 2. Um, that I know you got access to, right, as yeah. well. That basically you you give a, a prompt, uh, for example, uh, say you know, write or like draw uh, an image of a guitar that is being played by an avocado, and then it generates this image. Mm -hmm. So you can literally um, write whatever you want, and you're gonna obtain an image uh, that is based on this prompt. So yeah, um, yeah that's all, also fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, if you were given one million dollars, or it could be one billion or a hundred million, mm -hmm. uh, an, an insane amount that could actually make, it, make an impact, but you could only invest it in things that you're not involved with. So, not in yourself, not in yeah. a company you're affiliated with. Uh, and, and, that is, and that is not going to impact my life in any way, only the life of others? Mm. Well, that's 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 go, goes very far. Okay, okay. Because okay. there are companies with a mission that touch almost everyone's yeah, life. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, what, what projects or mm -hmm. uh, things would you invest in? Do you think? So, actually, that's an ideal question because I very recently wrote about this branch of philosophy called effective altruism, uh -huh. and it tells you what is the most effective way that you can spend your money. Uh, in, in a way that impacts the lives of others, but from a purely rational perspective. Like you, you, don't, you don't care about making something that looks very beautiful and, and has a, seems to you know, very, be very heroic, mm -hmm. but something that actually works. So for example, donating to cancer sounds very good, but if you donate to malaria research, uh, the the per per unit of dollar spent, mm. you can affect the lives of so many more um, people because malaria is not as researched like as as cancer is because it's in yeah. underdeveloped countries, mm -hmm. uh, whereas cancer is in developed countries. Uh, or for example, if you want to donate to a pet uh, shelter. Mm -hmm. um, then you, you again uh, nothing against that this is really cool that you're doing that but it turns out that if what you want is to reduce human suffering then donating for anti-farming uh, campaigns actually is it's not that it has a, a better like a, a more effective outcome by a factor of two it's that it has a more uh, an effective outcome by a factor of a hundred like our intuitions there are so wrong mm -hmm. so um of course the the research has to improve you know and it's constantly changing yeah. But um, but I would probably not try to think about this myself, but go into the research and see, you know, like okay. what is the best way to donate or invest money such that it has a positive impact on others. And I'm not claiming that these researchers know, like right. um, mm -hmm. this is something that everyone has to continue evolving. Uh, and, and, you know, okay, I guess improving. the key question, though, even if you go into this research, is what what is the, the, the impact? How are you quantifying that? And uh, in what time horizon? 
exactly that's very yeah you say like oh my impact is a number of lives that i save with this amount of money uh in how many years yeah uh because if it's in many years (laughs) if if that horizon is like suddenly 500 years then maybe you better like start caring more about like climate change or more catastrophic events and then your metric becomes how many trees can i plant or how many that's a very good question what is the the discount factor that we should use you you know so so um, uh, do you care more about people that exist like few people that exist right now or by a lot of people that have the potential to exist in the future mm-hmm. i don't That's know very, yeah. and i don't think a researcher can know about that um and and still you know like of course they try to quantify these things but one thing you can imagine is that the, the, our intuition could be very wrong from what's actually true uh, in that for example i believe that animal farming is really you know like it causes a lot of suffering in animals um because I, for some reason, I think that animals are sentient and they have the, the, the they experience positive and negative states of consciousness. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe there is a, like a random possibility that it's actually not the case. And in this case, actually consuming meat would would like not, preventing the consumption of meat would be detrimental because this would prevent us from at least from um animal suffering standpoint co2 emissions is another mm-hmm. topic but from this standpoint would be actually be a good thing that we eat meat because we're increasing the amount of pleasure in our bodies per se or maybe it turns out that uh, the the most sentient ob- objects in the universe is grass and then if we kill cows well that is actually good because cows eat grass so you know things that i, I don't believe these things to be true by the way sorry i, I don't want to spread conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy theories but it could be that our our intuition about what's good and bad ultimately is very far uh, from the truth mm-hmm. so you have to take everything of course with a grain of salt yeah. and at the end yeah probably you want to look it in under your own understanding okay, so I can see that you have an entrepreneurial man- mindset from the many projects that you've started, especially like um, uh, like Nash Judge and the other project um, called Your Mark, right? Yeah. Um, so, is this something that you see yourself doing in the future? Like, do you see yourself becoming or being an entrepreneur mm-hmm. or starting your own thing? Um, I, I consider the possibility of it definitely because I know that I I really like to put ideas into practice and um, I, I think that I should exploit this but it's not that I I want to commit myself to one path I, I ideally I would want to live a life in which I can do whatever I want you know if I want to have a stable job that allows me to you know not care too much about work then I will go on that path and if what I want is just the rush of it you know I, I want to really have my project and, and make it from scratch and make it have an impact in the world yeah. and I want to be able to do that uh, right now I yeah I, I, I don't know I just uh, I, I want to to wait until mm-hmm. I see what's, what's best for me right. in the future but uh, I for example I, I want to keep aside some part of the income that I generate in these next years because I know that there's a high chance that at some point I will be involved in a project like this yeah. and I want to invest in my own company right. in the future you know right. so I'm I'm already thinking about this right now <laughs> okay. even though I don't have the idea no, in no, mind no. what aspects of, of of a company in the future um are, are you less experienced in if, if i can share something about your mark which is this yeah. mm, social networking site to 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 have donations to non-profits uh, i put so much effort into the programming side of it i developed this mobile app and then this web app and i spent more time than i was spending at uni it was an insane amount of time because i was learning on the fly and I thought that I was gonna change the world. I thought, oh, this is amazing. I was really proud of it. Mm. Um, but little did I know that the programming side of it is only the tip of the iceberg. You, you need, like in my case, for example, I obviously need a legal team that would handle, you know, donations uh, because you have to make, you know, um, 
tax exempt donations and you have to give certificates of that and you have to manage different currencies and donations work differently in different countries and you want to contact NGOs so that they put their information in your platform. You want marketing because you want users to know about your idea. And there's so many things, of course, I just mentioned the, the, the second tip of the iceberg, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, at the time I thought, oh, I've made it, this is enough. Uh, publish, deploy. <laughs> yeah. We're waiting for all the downloads yeah. to come. Exactly. So, so, I mean, it's obvious. I don't need to explain why that didn't work. Yeah. But, but yeah. Okay, um, so that was a big lesson. Yeah. yeah. Underestimate the, like, even if there's, um, you know, a, a domain that you don't, you're not passionate about or you don't understand the value of it. Like, for example, a lot of times I struggle to understand why do we have marketing? You know, people would mm -hmm. buy the same products with or without marketing. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, but then you run a company without marketing and see where it goes. So yeah, uh, you have to understand that every component is essential, I guess. All right. Well, with that, we can finish this Oof. very long, <laughs> longest episode, I think, uh, yeah. of, uh, of the podcast so far. But it's been awesome, honestly, to have this final deep, long, uh, calm conversation Slowing without down, a rush, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, before you head out to San Francisco because we've been living in this house that we're in right now for the past year and man I don't know when I'll see you again <laughs> yeah I mean I hope to to come back soon but yeah definitely thank you for well for, first for being my housemate <laughs> but uh, then for inviting me and yeah the conversation was very very fun if you've enjoyed this episode please follow or subscribe to the show on whatever platform you use and don't forget to share this podcast with anyone interested in entrepreneurship, university student life, and the rising minds and technologies of the future, before they change the world. <laughs>